That stuff is, I don't play around with stuff like Father, that. You just, you just have a lot of trauma, you know, <laughs> you just need to deal with, you know, yeah. I just feel like I need to work on my journey, you know. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm in a, I'm in school and um, we're supposed to pick a topic to research and somebody just picked their research, the topic trauma. Which is like, Everything. wow, you're really, someone's really coasting for a C here, huh? <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, blah, blah, blah. This is Cyprian and Father Turbo. I'm going to ask them real quick, what's your guys' favorite color? Really? Just, yeah, we're just getting through this. We're just getting through this part. <laughs> I, black. Black is my favorite. Hey, is black really a color? It's all of them, isn't it? I thought that was white. That black white was... is that... Oh, yeah, black is the absence of color. White is all of the colors. Can you know how I know the that? Shades. I know that, know that from uh, black is a shade, but I know that from Green Lantern. By the way, that's why <laughs> that's the only reason I know that. So, thank you, Jeff Johns. Yeah, I mean, I have this conversation about once a month with my kids. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, gosh, I'd say purple. Purple. But, yeah. Realty majesty mine was blue growing up but i remember having this like reaching this like impasse when i was like eight or something where i was like green really should be my favorite color because at the time my childhood blanket was green like mm. my security blanket and not only that but in star wars the a-wings were the green squadron and mm. the a-wings were my favorite so i was like it really should be green but I was like, it's got to be blue. Like, I just like, I remember fighting so hard and telling my friends like, hey, because you know, that's what you're talking about when you're eight. It's like, hey, my favorite color is green. By the way, guys, big decision. It's gone back to blue. But now I think it's orange. I think orange is my favorite color. I'm really into it. So anyway, that's that. So that being said, I'm going to cut. I'm going to say a couple things real quick off the top of the off the top of the podcast. Oh, uh, I got some uh some feedback about last week's episode i'm not going to get into it i'm going to make a couple things really really clear off the top of the bat for the people who are not willing to go back and listen to the other stuff that we've talked about this ad nauseum so i don't know what cyprian and father's specific point on this stuff is and if they if they are going to disagree with me on a couple things that's totally fine i have never made the statement knowingly and if i have i apologize that covid19 is not real i have had it twice i have actually had it i think three times first time was absolutely brutal but i can tell you a couple things right off the bat about it one it did not feel natural it felt like a chemical it did not feel i've had many a flu in my life let's say being generous 15 15 flus in my life is never ever felt like anything like that when i lost my sense of taste and smell it smelled it felt like in my nose and in my mouth like i had inhaled too much cleaner like i was cleaning a small space and i didn't have a mask and i sprayed a bunch of like clorox bleach cleaner and it got in my nose that's what it felt like it felt dry and burning and irritated like a chemical would so take from that what you want our entire more mine rather, because I don't want to necessarily speak for everybody. Our entire beef with the whole thing is the way it was handled. The way the, the way that everybody flipped out. And as far as the measures that people took against COVID-19, blah, blah, blah. Whatever you want to do, sure. But when it comes to the sacraments of the church and wearing a flipping mask inside of church, that's where I draw the line. Where it's like, that is not necessary. And at best, you're like, at best, you're not necessarily thinking things through 
And at worst, you're doing some stuff I'm not really comfortable talking about. But I'm just saying that I'm just throwing down the gauntlet. That's how I feel about that. That's not to say that people didn't die from it because people absolutely did die from it. Like, uh, uh, I, I meant to look it up. There was a bishop who died of it. However, again, if I were a better host, I would have gone through and gotten these names. But recently, a, a, a talk was given by Father Cosmos in which he talks about that there were 20 people who communed from the same cup. One of them tested positive for COVID. The people who communed, the priest and the clergy who communed from that cup did not test positive for COVID, even though they shared the chalice with someone who had tested positive for COVID. There was one deacon who abstained that day. Lo and behold, he got COVID. End of discussion. That's that. Like, we're not going to go. And what further upsets what further upsets this whole thing is, is the fact that like, I, I was called on this and basically I was told like, look, I didn't know that you were a Trump dude. And I'm like, I can't believe that like one that's taken out of context. And like, we have covered, we've spent a whole episode bashing the right. We spent like a whole episode talking about the extreme dangers of the right and where like that, the dangers of that too. Like, I'm not a big, I'm not a big Trump dude, like at all. Like, I also think that like the whole thing is set up to create like a tyranny and it does, it's not going to, it's maybe going to come from the left, maybe going to come from the right. I don't know. So from here on out, if you're starting with this episode, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about party politics. We're not talking about who is right and who is wrong. Our path is the royal path. We are looking to Christ. We're looking towards his, to, 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 to people who are not willing to compromise the church to make A, follow government ordinances, B, make people comfortable. And we're certainly not going to compromise anything so that we can like get our numbers up. If people are turned off by the way that, that we're talking, people are turned off by the way we're talking. I'm sorry. There are loads and loads and loads of soft ecumenism that you can totally partake in, whatever. But at the same time, I'm like, we're not going to compromise the message. We're not going to change. Like, I, I've only gotten stronger. At the beginning of COVID, I was wishy-washy on several issues. And at a certain point, like, I decided to, like, go all in more or less on the church as much as I can. And every step of the way that I've taken towards, like, the church and the people I trust within the church it's been confirmed more and more and not like an emotional thing, not like a, Oh, look, I was right. It was like, Oh wait, no, the teachings of the church are absolutely correct. Like they're correct. Like God knows what he's doing. So that's the thing I needed to get off my chest. If you're starting with this episode, if you're not willing to go back and go through and listen to the other episodes and kind of figure out what the Royal path that we're talking about is, then I don't know what to tell you. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Like that, that's that, you know, um, we, you know, well, like, where did, where did you receive this pushback from? Like, was it somebody who knew you? It, it was a mixture of both. It was a mixture of both. And it was, it was overall, like, I'm not like, I can tell the difference more or less between a person who's just kind of like, uh, yeah, we're not probably going to see eye to eye on this. And somebody who's maybe not like taking all the context that we've given into consideration for like what we're talking about, because the problem is, is that if we start talking bad about Biden and his policies on COVID or whatever, blah, 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 if we bad mouth Fauci, then people think we go to the right. Like people are like, whoa, I didn't know you could be orthodox and be a conservative. You know, it's like, well, we're not. Like, that's not what I'm saying. And, I, and, and then if we like talk bad on Trump, it's like, OK, well, then, you know, then these guys are left. You know, that's not what's happening here. And the fact that that is the thing that keeps happening, where like sometimes we get pushed to the left or the right. Like, that's the problem. That's the problem. And then that's what like. The but you overall... realize there's nothing that you could that you could say, like what you just said is wonderful. But I mean, I there's nothing and and for people that I think that most of the people listening like 
they're like, yeah, absolutely. Same, same. Absolutely. None, none of the people who said those things to you could have even heard anything that you just said. It would, have, it would have been as though you were like a Charlie Brown, like, wah, 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 wah. like, I guarantee you, you could, you could say that right to them and their exact response would be, but you said blah, blah, blah. But that's no, but because you said this, then that's the Trump that like that supports Trump though. Like you can't, because you say this and you don't, but that's not, Oh, but no, because you say that, then you support this. It's like, you're they're absolutely. already. You're absolutely right. But what's more important is that I know when I go to bed tonight, I did yes. everything I could to just right. make the statement as clear as I possibly could. And I don't want to mince like you're absolutely right, Cyprian. That's absolutely true. And there are some people I'm not going to be able to reach. That's fine. I don't care. I leave them to God. You know, that's that's not a big deal. But what I am. I just want to make it perfectly clear that that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about, like, there is no, like, there is no, like, either or, you know, when it comes to this, like, it's, it's like, it's both and, like, it, again, the, the point is to not join in the crowd on either side mm -hmm. and walking down the path as best as we can. And of course, falling to either side, that's about the, I don't know, that's about the only thing that, like, I, I don't well, I would I would just interject here for a moment and I, I would just say that uh you know the reality is is that uh at any point in time we hope that a seed could take root uh and we hope against hope that although someone like we all have at some point in time have been locked into a perspective on something that something can kind of just like be used by God to kind of like give some sort of aha moment. Right. I mean, that's, if we didn't, if we didn't, you know, hope for that, we wouldn't do this. We wouldn't waste our time. Cause I know I'm not, you know, I don't need cheerleaders. You don't need your, none of us here need cheerleaders. Right. We're, we're doing, we, we do the project for a reason um, because we we all feel and agree that there really hasn't been and isn't a voice um, trying to highlight the dangers on both sides. Um, and also to that, we've all experienced a, some measure of repentance and that that measure of repentance has been powerful. And, you know, the scripture says, how will they know unless someone is sent to them? So, and I think that uh, I would just kind of, if I could humbly encapsulate some of what you're saying, you know, um, oh, like the, the reality is, is that uh, it is a harder thing to do, um, which is to kind of like walk the narrow road, the road path. I mean, that's the reason why we're doing this is because we, we see the errors to both sides and trying to to walk that and trying to really lift that up as the Christian way, right? So with all that being said, you know, on the one hand, um, woe unto you when all men speak well of you, right? And so I think it's important, like for me, I have to measure not so much each statement, but I, I have to measure my ministry um, with some degree of like, okay, um, and where's my integrity at? And I don't, I don't measure my integrity by applause or approval. I actually measure my integrity by my conscience and prayer and by, believe it or not, you know, um, where am I getting some sort of trial? I used to not do that. I used to not do that. And um, prior to 20, I was very much a person who I didn't think I was, but I was a person who measured much of what I did by people's approval. And when 20 happened, and and you know, I would just say this 2020, you know, COVID, all that was a blessing. I wouldn't take it back for anything. I'm grateful for everything that happened. And especially in especially specifically and explicitly the difficult things. I'm grateful for it. 
Um, but prior, like that season of life, I had had many experiences which God had been using to break me of man pleasing and, and being concerned about people's approval. But that was the thing that I really felt like, okay, you know, here is a fork in the road. I need to pick one. And so, yeah, Father, finish your thought. I have a question for you when you're done. And, and so with that, I, I just, that has been a litmus for me now. And, and if I'm saying something and there just becomes um, too much, you know, hurrah, hurrah, you know, I, I'm, I'm leery of that because I, I'm not interested in, you know, preaching to the choir so much as people might accuse me of or think. Um, because at the end of the day, and this is what I learned in 20, I have to like, not only look myself in the mirror, I have to like face God in my heart. And I'll, you know, I just made a decision that I would much rather lose the love and approval of everyone and be able to face God in my heart than the other way around. Yes. So that's for me, it's not about, you know, this isn't bravado, this isn't anything like that. It's just like the reality. Right. So forgive me, but that being said, this is, I mean, I feel like this is kind of a summation of what I've, what I've been, what I've been personally trying to share a lot here in homilies and just in my direction of people is you've got to find a line. And the reason why, the reason why I believe our project is, is still relevant and why I don't even really see our project that much about talking about COVID. I mean, COVID becomes a very low, you know, low hanging fruit, a very easy kind of referent to like discuss, you know, the kind of spiritual warfare, just to kind of put it simply, right? And spiritual warfare, not just being some sort of intellectual exercise, but like the holistic reality. Um, but I, I say all that to say this, you know, like it, it's really more relevant now because this idea of like finding your line, um, it's, it's so important because if when, not, not if, when something worse comes, and that may be just for you individually, it may be something in your own personal life, your family, work, whatever. If you don't have that line, if you don't know what your line is, then you don't, you're not going to be able to resist in the evil day. So, so that's something that I think to kind of surmise why our project's still relevant is because we're always discussing these things that are happening, being thrown at us just every day, every week. It's like, you know, a weekly news cycle is like what a, a news cycle would have been, you know, three years ago in six months, you know? So yeah. it's like so much is happening. And my hope is that I'm not saying that I am right. I, I can't speak for Andrew or Cyprian, but I, was just, I could even say maybe I don't think we're right on everything per se, but I do believe that the general method in which we're trying to discuss and look at these things is correct. Mm -hmm. It may not be correct on the exact details, but the thing is, is the litmus is always trying to be the church and Christ, not what the government says, not what the people says, not what this personality says but what is the church taught what is the church teaching but here's the other thing what is the holy spirit revealing right now because it's not just a dead a dead tradition it's not like some codex in a museum that we're referring to the holy spirit is alive and he's and he is dwelling in those who would seek god right and so not only do i believe that i know it from personal experience you know and so that is the thing right? The thing is like seeking discernment. Our tradition is, is Jesus is the good shepherd. and He's here to lead us. So. So I, I, I think that's very well stated. And I think I came out a little bit hot. But that's okay. I don't mind. Um, but I will ask, um, Father, when you actually start like, because I've actually been running into this where I struggle with the idea of like, I get really excited when I like get something right, like quote unquote, right? 
how do you like keep that reined in like personally like spiritually because like there's been times and i mean i'm a counselor where i i'm granted some insight into someone and i've actually felt myself like oh boy oh do, 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 do. okay cool 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 and then i like jump ahead and i actually like lose them at a certain point you know so i'm like well i feel like this has something to do with the way your dad treated you I'd be like, dude, you're absolutely right. I'd be like, okay, so then then that that relates to this whole other thing. And then they're like, I've totally lost them. You know what I mean? Like, how how would you say that like in a time because it's a lot more difficult when you are correct about stuff? What would you say? Like, how do you keep sober in that situation to the point where you're like, oh wait, just because I got this one thing correct doesn't mean like this train of thought I'm on is correct. I mean, <clears throat> forgive me, but it, it's it's really love, and, it, and I'm I'm gonna pull it out of the abstract. You know, I don't mean love as in flowery feelings, but let's just say, for some people, it'll be the opposite, right? But I'll just say, for the sake of us speaking here, in a weird way, counterintuitive to some people, it's much easier to. Um, gather in to call upon uh, your love and your, your devotion to Christ and have that love and devotion bring you to a place where um, the fear of God guides you. Because the inverse of that is to say, well, love for your fellow man. But I find that um, maybe it's the circles, you know, we run in. Um, maybe because many of us are just, maybe it's the generation we're living in. Um, there's all kinds of things. Uh, you know, drug addiction, the, the callousness, the jadedness, all these things in our society which cause us to struggle with loving our fellow man in a way that maybe isn't as good as it was back then. I, I don't know. I'm just saying that I know for myself and I know for a lot of my spiritual children and people I've spoken with and and been with over the years that it, it's a weird thing that many of us are misanthropes. Many of us struggle with this real kind of like. And that's a dislike of humanity. Yeah. Um, and for me, some people are going to laugh at this, but I've been told at times that, you know, like, man, you're such a loving person and this and that, you know what I mean? And I, I hope that's true. I mean, I'm a priest, right? But I just, I think what's important um, for people to understand, because most people, like, I don't really talk to many people who knew me before Christ. I just, they're, they're so few and far between now, you know? Um, but yeah, I did not, like, I truly am a changed person because of the love of Jesus Christ. Sorry, it may sound cheesy, but um, I was a very dark uh jaded person uh at one point in my life and i did not have love for people i may have been jovial i may have been fun to be around um but that was all very self-serving right um that was very self-serving and i'm i i'm not that person anymore i'm not saying i don't fight those tendencies i'm just saying i'm not that person anymore and it's Christ. It's not self-help. It isn't in those things like it's Christ that changed me, right? Um, now, all that to be said, um, that doesn't mean I don't remember. That doesn't mean I can't recognize it. I, quite the opposite, right? So the way that it works is that love of God, I find it just to be easier. The, the fear of God of like, God forbid, I would get more caught up in having people you know, applaud me for my ability to counsel someone or anything even close to that. I keep it to like, okay, God, like the fear of God, you know, this person's in front of me. And if I'm really trying to help them, you know, I just, I just stay on point. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Are you mm -hmm. following me? Because yeah. keep, your, you keep your wits about you. You have to, because when you, um, the, the other thing is, when you've had moments, and all this is just experience, um, when you've had moments of falling into that trap enough, and you've had those moments where God has chastised you, and you see that um, 
if you don't keep your wits about you that you can cause problems for people and the pain that comes from that, you don't want to do that again. You know what I mean? Um, so I just think a measure of it is the fear of God, the fear of God, which, which develops into a love of God. That's St. Anthony the Great. I no longer fear God. I love him, right? But the other thing is just honestly um, experience. And I think that's where a measure of humility also comes in. And the type of humility of not just like, hey, who am I? I don't know. That's there. But I'm talking about the type of humility that says, um, I don't have all the experience that I'm always going to have. I'm gaining that experience right now. And that's okay. Like that's, 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 that's an authentic, humble disposition to enter into, to be able to be patient with yourself and to be able to recognize, hey, you know what? I really don't have all the answers and I probably never will, but in this moment, this is where I'm at. Um, and so I'm just gonna do my best. Um, and by doing my best, that means two things. Um, I'm gonna keep myself in check. Um, and I'm also gonna be you know, waiting and expecting God to kind of be some sort of mediator here. It isn't just all me, right? Because if it's all just me, this person in front of me is done and I'm done. <laughs> you know what I mean? If it's just all me, there's there's no hope. But yeah, it isn't all me. I'm just a vessel. That person's just a vessel, and let's see what God does. Does that does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. That that kind of it's the that kind of scratched a niche inside of me a little bit. It's like because it's very there's a big chance for there's a very real temptation for pride when you're like working with someone and you see those eyes light up and they're like, man, how did you know that? And like having to kind of work around that is, I don't know. It's another, just the thing about a council. I have just learned how to, how to handle. So the, the depth of the church has been, I mean, I'm, I've been someone who's definitely suffered with this. Right. So like part of like, I, I think part of my relationship with the public has been, and it's just it's just been something that that for whatever reason I've tended to be ahead of a lot of trends for many many years and so I would often fall into this and it's basically prelist really mm. like I had a real long time where I was basically in prelist because I was like just because I happened to be like a first adopter or ahead of a trend then I felt like oh well I could just you know what I mean? At any given time, I can just tell you anything about anything, right? Which is like, obviously not the case. And I got it wrong a lot of times. And like, I, there, there, I have shame over, you know, people following me uh, on some of those things over the years. And like, again, with experience, I got much better. But to this point, there was actually two things, two individuals that I interacted with, but I, but I want to, this I think specifically because um, it just it kicked off for me because it just happened like a couple of days ago a young psychologist in um, Netherlands she contacted me she's at she's a psychologist and she's also now uh, in her surgery residency for like neurosurgery and she contacted me and she said hey I've got all these clients who um, she's in Netherlands she said I've got these clients who are sex workers right because it's legal there mm -hmm. and she said and they're trying to transition out and so she's like this is like a big interest for her i don't know whether she's planning on writing a book or whatever but it's a big part of her practice right and she's really she seemed dedicated to it wrote me a very long email and she was like uh you know i know who you are i've ran across things that you've done i ran across the show that you did but would you talk to me because clearly you've transitioned out of this i see you know the things you're doing in your life would you talk to me about your transition and it was interesting. We sat and we talked maybe for about three hours. And there was, there were a few points. And I think we reached like the important point where, and she was obviously trying to psychoanalyze me. And I kind of got that. And it was like, okay, she's young. This is like, she's fallen into a pattern that makes her comfortable. She's talking to somebody. She's trying to do her thing. Right. And I was yeah. like, okay. And at one point she goes, uh, oh, you've said demons a whole bunch of times now. <laughs> like you've said demons and, and it was interesting because I stopped and I was like, oh, okay. I see that we've reached a nice point here. And I was like, okay, look, I can talk to you if you would like. I can speak to, I can speak to you about this, what I'm talking about when I say demons in psychological terms. No problem. And so I went ahead and I did that. And she was like, oh, oh, yeah, that's very much in my, we were talking about identity and 
how she's seeing this split and identity of the people that she's dealing with and trying to get through to their real life and all of these things. And it was very interesting because as we carried on, what I, what I basically communicated to her was I was like, you know, I let her know about orthodoxy and, and my conversion. And I said, one of the biggest things about this was that that orthodoxy has given to me is it's given to me like the tradition has this toolkit that is so much more evolved than anything that the psychological could ever, not even evolve, true, right? Mm -hmm. It's just so much more like the psychological framework is like a, a like a, a, just it's missing everything inside of it. It's just like a, a almost like a, a, a rough drawing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like a, like mm -hmm. a stick figure. Mm -hmm. And, and I was talking to her and I said, so we got into this, you know, we get into the discussion and, and all of that. And then I saw her start to get it. And what was so interesting was that she was, as she was talking about all of these things, I said, well, this is the orthodox concept of kenosis. And it was like, what we had been talking about kenosis here, I mm -hmm. think last episode, mm -hmm. <laughs> father broke yeah. it down. Right. And so I had gone and and so, you know, after we're done, I wrote her an email and I said, okay, well, here's the, and here's a link to like Orthodox Wiki and Kenosis, right? She wrote me back today. This was day before yesterday. She wrote me back today, like this email where she was like, I can't believe it. I can't believe I'd never heard of this concept. I use these, 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 and, and all of this. And it's like, I had no idea that it's, it comes from Orthodox Christianity. Mm -hmm. She was like, this is, it's, it's in here. And she was like, oh, thank you so much. Like, now I'm going to have to ex explore this because I'm realizing that all of these psychologists that I was following, it's like, and, and the humbling thing for me was like previously, well, and, and it was, it was not even like, it was something I couldn't take credit for mm -hmm. in any way that it's almost like the best I could do is tell you the word, give you a link. That link is going to have <laughs> The fathers that are in there, because sure. I, I, there's no way that even in a lifetime, I'm going to be able to communicate to you the important information that is already existing in the tradition yeah. that the fathers have, yeah. right? True. And so it's like, That's right. I think that it's that separation of like, if I say anything true to you, that's Christ. Yeah. So right. I can't even like, for, right. at, at that moment, I'm like, ooh. That's wow, right. I'm tiny. I'm just reminded, like, oh, I didn't even say that. I, I think, glory to God, that came from Christ. <laughs> like, and, you know what I, mean? I think my struggle, and I won't go on about this, but I think my struggle is is understanding that here, and then not not necessarily like letting it sink down. So like, I can I can be riding high, you know, from like having this amazing counseling session with someone, you know, and all the wisdom I've used is from Christ. All the truth that I've managed to bestow is me quoting saints, you know, to the best that I can, that all that is true. And like, I'm like, I know up here that it's God. Like I know without a doubt, like it's God, but like getting it down here sometimes to kind of like bring me back down like I think that's my struggle is like the emotion quote unquote emotional or spiritual aspect of it being correct because for the first time I would argue in 34 years I forgot how old I was but in 34 years like I'm actually getting I'm kind of coming into my own and like what my vocation is what I'm actually being asked to do from God and it's tempting because like glory to god but i'm good at it like i'm good at it and i'm insightful god has given i i tell people like i wish my gift were something cool like working on cars or like jet engines or something like that like i wish i was more mathematically minded but again that's not what was chosen for me my chosen was like the gift of the gab was to be able to like talk to people and make them feel better and so all of that is there all of that stuff is there, but it's information and actually getting it to become truth, like that I experience it as like a fundamental aspect of my reality. It's like a cornerstone of my reality, being it, bring it like having it like shade my reality where I look at the door and think like, okay, the only reason I'm opening that is because Christ, like the Holy Spirit is energizing my body, you know, that type of thing. Like that's, that's kind of what I'm struggling with is this idea of like, understanding it psychologically and bringing it down to like my heart so 
and I think father touched on that. It, it's my love. It's my fear of God. It's like, do and I want to have to give like an account for being lukewarm in this aspect you, of my faith? You know, the thing is, I was getting back to what I was saying about um, the humility of like patience, you know what I mean? And um, just recognizing, like you said, the information is there, but it only becomes knowledge through experience. And that's, that's what it boils down to. And that, and as you, it's, it's this weird paradox, you know, it's like, um, the longer you live, the more you see how little time you have, but then you also begin to recognize that there's nothing you can do about that. And that some things just take time. They just take time. And being able to accept that. And right? failure. I mean, you know what failure is? Failure is um, a refusal to accept an experience. That's what failure is. <laughs> okay, totally. Because <laughs> if I'm accepting an experience for what it is, I haven't failed, I've just learned, right? But when I refuse to accept that experience, then I begin to fail. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I think, and people don't want that. I don't know. I think that's a big draw for intellectualism is like this idea of like, I don't want to experience the failure. I just want to be right. Like, so I just, I just want to study and get the correct answer. And, that, and I think that's the thing about the hubris. And that's the thing about, um, you know, like, I, this may be some splitting of hairs and maybe some semantics, but I'm going to run with it just for the sake of the conversation and hopefully it'll make sense. But uh, I am critical of things, but I don't consider myself a critic. There was a time in my life when I, I was a critic, you know, um, and kind of proud of it. That's part of the identity, kind of like, you know, um, like Sipper was saying earlier, you know, like kind of proto hipster type of thing, just like always being in the know or knowing or trend or experiencing that. Um, and part of wielding that identity on a kind of superficial psychological level required this, this thing of like, oh, I'm the critic. I'm in the place of judgment and I'm like calling this and this and that out. But I, I've let, you know, I've let that go, not because like, oh, I'm, I'm past that now. It's not that, it's just the fact that like, um we've talked about this before in the past too it's like uh when you understand where ideas come from right mm -hmm. for me the big the big turn was realizing like oh i'm not seeing anything necessarily because i'm sharper and i don't really have ideas because i'm brighter i just recognize that i've maybe facilitated some things that have allowed my intuition or certain things to be more open but you know, at the end of the day, those ideas are mine. And maybe catching on to something, you know what I mean? And when you recognize that in an honest way, it's, there's no, like, there's no room to be proud. You know what I mean? It's just because it's like, how can you be proud of something that you, you know, in your heart of hearts that you have nothing really to do with? You're just the one observing, right? Now there's people who, they persist in it and they, they do, be, they do, you know, wield some sort of pride, but that's a whole different thing. You know, most people don't want to even expend the energy to live that kind of lie, even if they could. You know what I mean? Now, the internet's full of people like that, but if you take influencers, quote unquote, you know, per capita against the rest of society, right? <laughs> most of society, like, can't even, like, doesn't have time for that. They're too busy trying to just survive. Absolutely. If that makes sense what I'm saying yes. at all, you know? So like this thing about experience and, and maturity, um, it's really, I mean, it, it's the big thing. And it, that's why being a critic is not really the thing. Now, being critical is, and, and I would say it might make things easier for the conversation if I say discerning. Mm -hmm. Coming discerning is important. Um, and this is also where, you know, really learning, I mean, I, I talk about it so much, but it's just like, um, 
there is no room for unbridled emotions in the spiritual life. There just isn't. Because emotions lead you to that place of the critic. They put you in the, in the seat of the judge. Unbridled emotions cause you to see something in a way that is incorrect, mm. right? I mean, it, it's just, that's what they do, right? But when you bridle the emotions, right? Um, they're able to take you somewhere. They're able to help you to kind of discern something, right? Because it's not about complete, it's not about getting rid of the emotions, right? We've talked about this before. It's not about being Spock, hmm. right? It's not about being Spock. It just means you don't have to be a stinking Klingon. You know what I mean? You don't have to be just uh, completely, you know, encapsulated by your emotions. And, and the way I'm getting at with all this is this. Uh, when you look at our, when you look at the, the, the Christian life, the spiritual life, and specifically Orthodox Christianity, and you look at the words of our Lord and Master, you look at the words of the fathers and the mothers of the church, what you're going to find is the center of it is the cross every time. And the cross is not something that you can approach if you're governed by uh, emotions. And what I mean by emotions, I'm speaking of not emotions in proper order as God intended. I mean emotions as most of us exist in, experience them, right? Something happens, I have a emotional reaction to it, that emotional reaction to it, I, I deem as accurate and some indicator of truth. And then I respond to that. This is where, um, you know, offense and being offended is, is, such, is such, a, um, such a problem. If I could go a little bit further, if you guys will allow me, right? Yeah. Please do, because this thread is, this is the thread. This is very this interesting. Is, this is the thread. Very, very, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to just jump right in to kind of prove my point. I'm going to start, I'm going to highlight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull a group of people out as an example. And I'm going to wield this example with full authority. Okay. Uh, the, in a more general sense, right? In a more general sense, the African-American community, right? The reason why the African American community suffers the way it does in a more general sense, generally speaking, is because uh, within the last 40 years, 50 years, there has been a, um, a nurturing of a disposition of unbridled emotionalism. I'm, I'm just gonna say it, right? Um, that tendency, which hasn't always been the tendency for quote unquote African-American folk, right? Just so we're clear too, just so we're clear. Um, I'm using the word African-American, not as a uh, politically correct statement. I have to use it because I'm not talking about Nigerians. Sure. I'm not sure. talking about Ethiopians or Eritreans or people from Ghana, right? Sure. Because those people from Africa, they're coming from a much more older and sober culture. Yes. They yes. don't suffer from the quick offense that really is indicative of immaturity that many African-Americans suffer from, right? Generally speaking, generally speaking, on a cultural, kind of broader cultural thing, right? This is what I mean by like, it's problematic. And I would submit to you, this is why certain powers and principalities are able to manipulate quote unquote African-American folk towards their end, right? Um, because it's, it's a well-known fact that if you just say something to certain segments, large segments or you know, perceived large segments of African-Americans, doesn't matter whether it's true or not, you're just gonna get them to respond a certain way and they're angry or riled up emotionally. And now you can manipulate them to achieve your ends. Yes. 
um, one half of the political party spectrums, like we live in a binary political system, one half of that system has been doing it since the 60s, right? Just so we're, just so we're clear, uh, I am not a Republican, just so we're clear, right? But I am talking about the Democratic Party, for sure. 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 You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and this is, an, this is an opinion. This is just fact. It's, it's fact that I'm well prepared to send whole essays on to show empirical data numbers to prove the point, right? So the point with this though, is that you can begin to see how without sobriety, without um, those things that the tradition gives us on an individual level, or even a cultural level, like a scales up and scales down, you become susceptible to manipulation. Now, as an Orthodox Christian, I am neither uh, a I'm neither a uh, Pollyanna-ish optimist, nor am I a uh, nihilistic skeptic. Right? Which, uh, Pollyanna. What was that word before optimist? Yeah, like a naive optimist, right? Okay. okay. Or like a jaded skeptic. Sure. Right? I got gotcha. you. Sure. I'm a, I would I would say if I can make something up on the spot, I'm a realist. Right. I'm a realist. My new father, um, Seraphim Rose, says sobriety is seeing things as they are. So. Seeing as they are. It's, it's seeing them as they are. So what am I saying? Well, here's what I'm saying. Um, the be- the, what is true, what is good, and what is beautiful, you need all three of those things to apprehend reality, right? You begin to lean into just one to the detriment of the other, um, you get out of balance, right? Um, and unfortunately, for a lot of people who are given over to kind of emotional states and, and all these things, like they don't even really have an apprehension of the beauty, but you know, the, the aesthetic of something is where they get lost. And that absence of truth leads them to an inability of, dis- of perceiving and discerning what is good. And that is why emotions become this kind of litmus for them because um, conflating what is beautiful and good with what feels good, right? And that is super problematic. That's where you get so much of this distortion of Christ where it's like um, you speak a truth and that comes across as mean or not loving or all those things. But the reality of it is, is um, when you truly have the best interests of someone in mind, you speak truth. Yes. You, you have to speak truth. And that truth the, the ability for someone to receive that truth is going to be contingent upon their disposition towards their emotional state. Now, I'm not talking about people in the 20s or the 30s or the 40s. I'm talking about people now, right? People who are under the age of 50, 50 and down, let's just say, right? Um, that's what I'm talking about. And it's really important to say this because as time is going on, the more that someone spins, which is, I get it. I get the kind of irony of the situation because all of this is on the internet, right? But the more that people spend time being influenced by not just the content, but the medium, it, it, what it does is it flattens out people's um, ability to really have uh, the robust vocabulary of emotions and understanding the nuance. And that's where you get people living off of sound bites. And sound bites are constructed to manipulate people emotionally, right? Right. By definition. By definition. Sound bite, right? Yeah. That's where you'll get this this phenomenon because I will just say the project we're doing, all it's done is really kind of like, um, kind of give a snapshot for me, but I've been suffering from this for a while. And the fact that like, 
it becomes easy and I just, it is what it is. I'm not complaining, I'm just saying, I'm just observing something, right? I'm just sharing an observation with you guys. It's easy to just kind of take a snapshot of what I see it all the time. Snapshot of what I say, but the whole context is gone. Yes. Right? And the reason for that is, is because very few people, it's not that they don't want to, but it's just, it is difficult to train yourself to, you know, uh, take in the truth. Mm -hmm. Like, like I was just talking about this uh, in catechism, I think last night, like, we think that we automatically have a good conscience. I know what's right and what's wrong. And I'm just going to say, no, you don't. No, you don't. Um, your conscience is defiled. Uh, and I'm speaking to, to you. You know, if you can hear me, your conscience is probably defiled. Like, you've lived in a society and a culture where there are so many things, like, I could get, you know, I don't want to, but there's, there's, there's graphic acts that so, that so many of us have been taught because of society that's no big deal. And just a couple of generations ago, they were like illegal, yeah. right? Um, that should tell you something on how far gone we are. And now you're, someone could say, well, what are you talking about? This is what I'm talking about. Um, the flattening of our personhood through the medium of sound bites and all these things, it, it, it flattens or deadens the, um, the ability to perceive, it's almost like, um, have you ever had that experience of like, some people, some people think it's BS, but I, I stand by it. There is a difference between me listening to an album on vinyl on a good system. We were just talking about this. We were literally just talking oh, about really? this. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, like, there's a difference between me listening to vinyl to vinyl on a good system versus like on a really crappy pair of headphones that I got on American Airlines. Like, does do you understand? I mean, what I'm night saying? and day, night and day. Yeah, it's yeah. like night and day. And why is that? Well, super your auto engineer stands. It, it, the compression and the flattening of yeah, everything. You don't, you don't have the range. You don't have the range. No. It's just it's out of it's it's all squeech squelched down yeah it's all squelched down and that's what i'm talking about that's what happens to us through the medium of these things if that's exclusively how you're perceiving things right mm -hmm. so so I, I would just say i don't even know why we're here but i guess it's just kind of stream of consciousness but like i would just say like one of the reasons why again another reason why i think our project's important is because um and maybe it's one of the reasons why we we are at a certain level and probably won't break that level of, of like numbers, whatever. But like, I don't think anyone's gonna disagree that, you know, there's, there's, a certain, there's a certain depth and range of frequency that we're, that we're always trying to maintain here, which is not easy, right? And it's not easy, especially in the fact of like, it, to really get the full experience, you, you can't just take one episode. You have to take the kind of bigger context because we're always referring to something else. And, and, and I'm just saying, that's just a snapshot of what it means to live in the tradition. Because it isn't enough for me to just kind of like talk about what I've known in my whatever. I have to refer to the saints and I have to refer to the bigger picture. I have to refer to Serbia. I have to refer to, you know what I mean? I have to refer to all these things that are outside of me because my scope is so limited. And that's where someone becomes something else because when you're in the church, now you are part of the body of Christ, and now your experience, your ability to, to enter into experience becomes eternal. You begin, to, you begin to enter into the space of truth, which is beyond you. Yeah. But here's the thing, just so everyone doesn't think I'm getting too woo-woo, here's the thing. When you, this is why pride is so, it's such folly. Pride is such folly. When you just assume how you feel is the truth, mm. you are just pulling from the grain of sand in, in the sea. You mm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it's such folly. You're saying like, no, this grain of sand is the thing, right? And so that's why I would just say for me, 
it's very easy. Am I all these things? Am I proud of my arrogance? Sure, that's fine. It doesn't even matter, right? But the thing that people need to understand is like, there's a difference between the confidence of like, oh, you don't understand what we're talking about. It has nothing to do with my opinion. Yes. I'm just pointing to something beyond me. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, and yeah, the yeah, confidence yeah. of that, you're mistaking yeah. for pride or for right. whatever. But the problem with it is, is you have your own pride, yeah. which is, which is, I mean, it, it's difficult when it's get, when it's butted up against the re, the truth of, of of who Christ is. And for a lot of us, we go through this those years of kind of approaching the church, become a catechumen, and then you eventually get over it. But for some of us, it takes a little bit longer. For some people, and this is part of the problem with where orthodoxy is at right now. I mean. For a lot of people, they come into the church and they don't really have a parish, a community, or a priest who's challenging their presuppositions and saying, like, mm-hmm. look, at the end of the day, what you think doesn't really matter. You'll do if the more that you submit yourself to the to the teachings of the church, the better off you'll be. Other than that, you're just you're just kind of like spinning your wheels. I'm a, I'm just gonna say, you know, when we came into the church, you know, going on 20 years, whatever, like. The church has changed a lot from my perspective to now. Like now there's just because of the internet, because of all these things, it's just so easy to kind of pick and choose what you want and to kind of like Frankenstein your vision of orthodoxy. And I and I I totally I've been guilty of it at one point in time of my life. Right. So that's why I'm just saying from experience, but like. When you begin to understand that orthodoxy isn't just a flavor, it isn't just some kind of addendum, it isn't just like a type of coat that you put on and off as a season, right? When once you get that, then you begin to enter in the space where it's like you get you begin to see that it is life and everything, and that's why this project exists also because there isn't anything that exists that Christ in the church doesn't have some say in. Yeah, right? that's, that's part of the problem is that there's these thoughts that there's these dichotomies and and we're trying to remove the dichotomy, right? But you can't remove the dichotomy. You can't even approach it. You can't discern it if you if your if your bandwidth is just like flat. If you're just if you're not getting all of the frequencies that are there. Does, I know that was a super stream no, consciousness, but does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a it's. As always, you know, hitting on principles that keep coming up, even that have come up as recently as today. And it's like this idea of, you know, going toward the comfortable thing. But like, and I see that that as being like the Frankensteining, where the Frankensteining comes in whenever I see this Frankensteining thing. And it like, it's incredible because it is, it is really just the, the, it's just this, re- this reflection and this echo that I see now and everything is like, Whenever I see Frankensteining, as soon as I scratch the surface, what I see is that like the reason why they're not taking this frequency is because at this frequency is discomfort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like at this frequency is like, oh, no, no, no. But I don't like that. Mm -hmm. Like I'm comfortable with this. I like this. This feels good. This right here, this doesn't feel good. Cyprian, Matt, please forgive me. Yeah, go ahead, please. I'm sorry, Cyprian. Go ahead. This is... You hit something that I just, I want to go back to something that you hit. That discomfort, like that's what the tradition of our church is trying to inculcate in us. Inculcate, what does that mean? Um, like foster? Foster. Foster, foster. forgive okay. me. Forgive yeah, me. no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm just making sure. Forgive me. Um, is, a, is an ability to endure the, the discomfort and I dare say even have it, learn a taste for it. I, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and I don't, I, please, Cyprian, I, I want you to continue. I just, I just want to jump in because it's really key, right? Getting back to a, um, the example I used earlier, like, I'm just going to say it again. The African-American community, that was the mission. That was like the job, right? God gave the African-American community this charge to um, manifest, to embody this profound truth of 
discomfort and suffering brings about depth and dignity. Like prior to oh man oh man. like forgive yeah. me you know what i mean yeah, like you that, are you are go no, please go because you want it this right is thread. This like, is thread. like that's that's the thing right when you look at the african-american community from the time of slavery through the civil war through reconstruction getting into jim crow getting into really the kind of like zenith of the civil rights movements, what you have is a people who, uh, who no one would deny at that point suffered incredible um, indignity, pain, all, all those things, right? No one's gonna deny that, right? But the trick was, did it in such a fashion that strength, nobility, love, humility, all these Christian virtues were embodied in a community. What happened was there were some movements within prior to this, but ultimately this begins to shift towards the end of the quote unquote civil rights movement. And then what begins to take the place of that nobility, that humility, that strength, all those things, that dignity, um, envy, <laughs> uh, uh, rage, mm -hmm. and, and like, and I, and people want to argue, well, it's because this and this and this and this. Well, it really wasn't about because holding on so long, holding on so long, because um, the numbers say otherwise, right? You had more marriages and families intact, which here's the thing, family, is a Christian symbol of wholeness, of communion, right? That isn't a Eurocentric thing. That isn't a whatever. That is, that's a cosmic symbol that the Christ has given to all humanity. Are you guys, are you guys following me? Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So under, under, under real quote unquote oppression, African Americans thrived. And they, they had a nobility and a dignity, including, here's the thing, the ability to persist in forgiveness and a desire for forgiveness and love. Christian values, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. You move into modernity, and it isn't just the civil rights movement. It's the counterculture movement. It's the psyop of drugs, of the hippie movement, all those things begin to turn that upside down, the reign of the Antichrist begins, and it's like, hey, those things are for suckers, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, forgiveness, dignity, hum humility, all those things, those are like, what is that? Those aren't virtues. That's, that's a sign of weakness. That's a sign of a sucker. It's about having money, like all the, all the I don't need to say, right? It all, it all begins to turn when that inability, when that awareness of the value of discomfort and what it what it brings forth was was disregarded, but it was the strength of the community. It's what it's what caused the world at one point in time. Why did Hitler eventually have to concede and have respect for Jesse Owens? Right. Yeah. Well, what yeah. you know what I mean? What where is the where is the heroic story? Whatever. Like there are no heroes past the civil rights movement. Why? Because no. everything is. It, it it is it's devolved, right? Does that make sense? What I'm That's saying? Really, it's it's the the principle the principle of discomfort and strength, right? Like that discomfort leads to strength. That's actually it's funny because that's actually what I was thinking when it came up today. Because a, a an individual who is a podcaster who you are going to get to know, Father, because I think you two are going to do something soon, had tweeted something where he was, he's he's he's. He's getting into a thing. He's trying to help men. It's fantastic. But he had tweeted some things and he was like, oh, you want to do the things that will make you into a man that's kind of a manosphere thing that, that is able to attract stellar women. And one of the things that he said was like, get into the gym, but don't worry about building muscle or charting your progress or any of that thing. Just get in there. And I was like, look, man, this is like, I like that you're trying to help, but like, this is really bad advice. And like what it basically came down to in the thread was he was like, well, 
But, you know, those things were the things that I was intimidated by and like made me uncomfortable. And that's why I, you know, I said, just go in and do it. And I was like, no, no, no. What you're doing in the gym, the, what you're doing is you're going into a, a, a place that is, you know, controlled so that you can specifically so that you can encounter discomfort and so that you can embrace it and get used to the feeling of, I am going to go and make myself uncomfortable. Yes. And if you will do that in the context of the weights, mm -hmm. you will build muscle. That's literally mm -hmm. how your body builds muscle. Mm -hmm. If you don't walk out of there in a state of discomfort, you will not over time build muscle. If you walk out of there in a state of extreme discomfort, not injuring yourself, right? And that's mm -hmm. the balance that you're going to learn. That's the art of it. That's the art. The art is how far can I push myself to where I don't injure myself? And that's why your form is perfect and your attention to detail is perfect and your focus is perfect. And all, I used to call the gym my church, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, it's the place where I learned the principles of who I need to be in order to pray, mm -hmm. in order to fat, because fasting was a part of it, right? Like controlling my diet and learning the discomfort of calorie reduction and learning the discomfort of denying myself certain things. And it's like, that, that is the missing element. And it's the thing that like, when I encountered orthodoxy that I saw that that was like, because it's not in Western Christianity, like mm -hmm. the Joel Osteen mega church, mm -hmm. there's no discomfort. It's the exact opposite. How comfortable can we possibly make you so that you will keep coming back? So forgive me. I, I just I know I'm harping on the thing. It's just Go ahead, it, it is. Just for the record, everyone, there was no there's no discussion before the podcast. It's like we don't we don't we don't really plan it out. So, anyways, uh, that's another thing that I believe with every fiber of my being, at least at this point, that God had put before the African American community, and like the quote unquote black church was to be that voice in the midst of manifest destiny and all that stuff is to be like no 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 that's not the cross no 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 that's not the way of the christ right it's this discomfort it's it's winning and losing it's all those things which the western christianity fundamentally imperialism colonialism all those things which are true like like i don't really want to get in debate in regards to some of the kind of like antecedents of that but like i would just say that they, they, they fundamentally do not have that canonic um, cross-bearing ethos that the Eastern, that Eastern Christianity does. And that I would submit to you, I would submit to you humbly that quote unquote, African-American, you know, spirituality, black church, quote unquote, was the explicitly only voice in Western Christianity at that time that was saying, no, the discomfort, the cross, this is the way out. Like that's where the-, the It's the in the music. You can the, hear I, I it in gospel, so like traditional gospel music. Head. Like you just feel, <laughs> you, was, it's in the blues. I mean, I that's, just, what, that's what Sam Phillips was recording in Sun, yes. like Sam Phillips, right? Sun Records, obviously yeah. he's the one, Roy Orbison, Elvis Presley, Howlin' Wolf, Jerry Lee Lewis, you name it. Like. I listened to his autobiography when I was, which was perfect, when I was like renovating what would become my, uh, my art gallery and, and event space in, in Vegas. He was working in the fields. Sam Phillips, white mm -hmm. guy, right? He was working in the fields as a young man in the South. You know, he's from a poor white family. He's working in the fields. Mostly everybody around him is black. Afterwards, they would go back, you know, and then an old guy, man would come basically, you know, and like, because th there's no retire retirement, whatever. And they would pay him to sing to, uh, it'd be a blues man, right. you know, and he would do gospel songs. He would do, he would, and he would do the blues and like Stan Phillips heard this and no white people had ever heard this. And it was, it was the suffering, mm -hmm. but not a suffering of, as a victim, but not, a, sorrow, not, not at all. Suffering. It was no. sorrow as the world sorrows, which leads no. to death. It was the yes. sorrow. It was a godly sorrow. A and sorrow. that's and that's why he said, 
this it he made it that's why he learned how to become an engineer he built a lot of the equipment that was recording equipment at the time he built it so that he could record it and allow the world to hear it because he was like this is the most important thing you will ever hear mm -hmm. yeah. that was his that was the reason now that evolves and it becomes about money and all of these things you know what i mean and he's the first person to ever record that he recorded the first rock and roll song right which is ike turner's band and they're doing rocket 88 and all of this but it like it be it became a about like it got the soul was taken out of it yeah right and that's but when we talk about the soul the soul is the discomfort mm -hmm. like i mean it's the blues right like it's mm -hmm. like what is inside of that and at the end of the day it's like yes these people have been working in the fields like extreme discomfort but then here is this thing and it's uh it's not let's let's hear the happy thing no right it's let's hear the beauty in the discomfort that's right and understand how it's nourishing us that's right i was i was just talking about this with someone the other day who is in early recovery and he lost a, has a, a devastating blow like it, it's it's devastating that it's every parent's worst nightmare i think i've actually talked about this guy before he's such a he's such like a He's like a person in my life right now that's making a huge impact. But uh, we were actually talking about this like correlation of like the people who complain the most probably have the least amount of problems to complain about. Like when they when someone is complaining a ton, it's like I tell people like your problem is you don't got enough problems mm -hmm. like you, you you've got a cross. It's pretty small. And I mean, I guess I saw there's like this meme of Bruce or no, uh, Mel Gibson talking to, I don't remember the guy who played Christ in Passion of the Cross um, or Passion of the Christ, uh, whatever his name is, but it's like offset, like they're taking a break for a second and the actor's covered in blood and he's like sitting there, you know, and Mel Gibson's talking to him, you know, like as a director is talking to an actor, it's like me complaining to Christ about my problems. <laughs> and like he's like covered in blood he's got the cross on like and like he's got the whole makeup on and everything like that and i was like bro like the, because he came in our first session this guy and he laid this on me and i was absolutely like had no idea how to handle it i'm like it's something i've never experienced the only thing i could talk about was like bro you have the best perspective of anyone in this program right now because you truly know what matters and what does not matter like you now realize the stakes of what's happening here and so he's like because he talks about sitting in a house full of other men who are sitting there complaining you know and he's like and he's like it takes everything i have to not just be like what are you doing your problems are so tiny i was like but do you say anything he's like no He's like, because I don't have time for it. I'm like, that's it. That's it right there is like, because you have this perspective, you have this, you have this like outlook on life that only this horrific tragedy that happened to you could give you. And it's like, it, it, I was like, bro, if you can get through this, if you can stay sober, you'll be like floating. When you, when you like walk into halls, you'll be floating just like, just like face palming people, like as, as you're like floating by, just being like, shut up with your problem, shut up with your problem. It's like the people are actually, are actually, he won't be face palming in them, he'll be embracing them because he'll, I, be, he'll be able to soak it in because, yeah. because that's the thing. It's funny you bring that up, Andrew, because I was thinking about this today as I was doing some pastoral visits on the road, I was just thinking about some stuff that had come up and this is specifically what you're talking about. And I was remembering this understanding of forgetfulness. Like we forget, let me give an example. Um, you know, there's, there's a certain, you know, it's like there's spiritual genetics, right? So like many of my spiritual children have suffered some pretty serious things. You know what I mean? It's part of the reason why I guess I'm a spiritual father. Cause like, you know, 
I get it, I understand it. But I see, I see there's this weird space where um, working maybe sometimes too well, I don't know, and they actually begin to experience healing, right? But the problem is that there's a certain art that they aren't learning at the time and they begin to forget. They begin to forget what they went through. They begin to forget those initial sins or traumas, literal traumas that they went through. And then they begin to be able to complain about certain things that, you know, 10 years ago, three years ago, three months ago, they would have never complained about those things. Absolutely. Because, because the pain they remember, right? And what's happened is they have forgotten. They ha Does that make sense? I have they a really... I have a really good oh, yeah. example of this. I've and I use it all the time. And um, when I start meeting with people, and it's like three months into their recovery, and I'm talking like they're banging using like crick or like gutter water, you know, like like mm -hmm. they're eating Big Macs that they found off the street, blah blah blah. There's a part actually in the Walking Dead comic where um, they just got through this really awful time, like the gang, Rick and the gang, or whatever. And they get into, I think, I don't really remember. It's been years since I've read it. A civilization, I think it's called Alexandria. I can't remember. And they're rescued. These people have medicine. They have food. They have heat. They have showers. They have, like, electricity, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and Rick is saying they're getting a haircut, and the power shuts off. And the lady who's cutting his hair, she's like, oh, he's like, what's going on? He's like, yeah, we have to shut off power once a week or something like that you know, like or every other day or something like that, because the generators can only take so much. And we figured out we'd ration the power, blah, blah, blah. And Rick's like, I don't even care. Like, I don't care. This was so bad out there. This is heaven. I will never complain about this. And the lady who's cutting his hair is like, mm, I give you two weeks. I give you two weeks until you it starts to annoy you. And that's absolutely true. Like, I see it all the time where people come in and like, dude, ate my cereal. Mm -hmm. I don't know how yeah. I'm gonna get past this. Yeah. And I'm like, do you date my cereal? Do you did this? Do you do that? And it's like that becomes the thing that they need to vent on, or they need to whatever, right? And they can't let it go. And like, they cannot let it go, and there's fixation on it. And which this gets us back to what we were talking about earlier: is there is an art to prayer and the spiritual life. It is the art of. This is why. You cannot have actual orthodox spirituality without asceticism, which that's what most people have encountered. They've gotten the historical elevator pitch. They've gotten the, I'm burnt out on evangelicalism and I found this kind of like exotic thing and, and whatever. And that maybe carries them. But the thing is, is you need to have the ascetic aspect of the tradition because the asceticism when you practice it, this is the thing that keeps that tension of like, I need this discomfort because if I don't, right? With <laughs> spiritual children, if you can hear me, right? When you start complaining about so-and-so ate your cereal or so-and-so said this, or so-and-so said that, I'll say to you, you have forgotten where you come from and you have you are not practicing enough asceticism because you become comfortable right when you subject yourself right because asceticism is a willful willing subjecting of the self bodily discomfort for the sake of spiritual benefit right mm -hmm. when you practice that right the increments of this kind of pettiness become shorter and smaller mm -hmm and quantity and quality, right? Mm. If practicing that, this is where you become the critic. This is where you become all these things. This is where, you know, a truth feels like it's an offense. Yeah. Because your pride is just, you know what I mean? You're so sensitive because a... you've lost your callus. You've lost the kind of callus that's needed to lift the weight to play the guitar, right? Some you need some cows to play the guitar skillfully. It's right? like if this person ate your cereal. Oh, clearly you're not fasting.
If you're complaining about somebody eating your cereal, I know you're not fasting. That's I have <laughs> such a hard time convincing people. It's much easier to slip when you're feeling good than when you're feeling bad. Like I'm like, I talk about like 100%. first cup of coffee of the day feeling where like life is magical. The sun's beaming down. The birds are chirping. You know, everything's wonderful. Someone cuts you off in traffic. I am that much more likely to like, let that eat my lunch. Like then if I am suffering, if I'm struggling with something, person cuts me off and I'm like, sure, if I'm not doing it correctly, there's that temptation. It's like, oh, it's just one more thing. You know, it's just like, you know, I, uh, you know, but if I'm like prayerful and actually mindful and working an okay spiritual program, actually looking to God, then that doesn't really bother me. I'm like, oh, whatever, you know, like maybe, maybe they're having an awful day or something like that. I don't know, you know, whatever I need to do to get through that moment. But I have such a hard time convincing people like feeling good is not what we're going for. Like that's not the end that that can be a product of working in okay of like looking to God, like I'm happy, joyous and free to an extent. But that's, you know, at a certain point, like I get nervous. I get nervous when things are going too well, when it, when it's been a little while since something bad has happened. And I'm not talking about like, I'm just sitting, I'm not some holy person waiting for the next trial. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. But I do get nervous when things have been good for a while. And the same way I get hopeful when things have been bad for a little while, like there will be a resurrection. Like it may not be the resurrection I want. Right. It may come at a super unexpected time, but I can tell you, and I, I won't talk much longer, but I had this amazing experience after Lent. Last Lent was pretty brutal. Um, not just spiritually, physically. My daughter had an accident. It was a, a big thing for our life for a couple of weeks, you know. Wasn't the worst thing to happen, but it was certainly like not cool. And like just the struggle, making the services, my wife being pregnant, you know, having two young children. There are people who have much harder than us, but that was a difficult time for us. Like it was just kind of challenging. Um, and I got called for jury duty. It was like the Monday after Holy Week. It was like a uh, bright Monday. You know, I got called for jury duty and I, they said, nope, you're good. We, we don't need you. You're exempt for the next four years. And I walked around downtown for like two hours and everything was just lovely. Like it was just, I was like the wind. I, I sat in, on top of a park. We have a park on top of a building downtown. I sat in that park and watched traffic for no joke, 20 minutes. I just sat and like thought and like reflected because like my mind was finally kind of out of the blender for a little bit. So like, it was like given back and I kind of just like relax and feel, but it was only because I had been dragged to the, while well, not hideously deep, but the depths that I was and able to like that walk back up that like that kind of rebuilding it it can be so pleasant it can just be because it's like simple things it's like i'm not chugging my little wonderful spin drifts anymore because i'm just trying to get the caffeine i'm actually enjoying the taste you know i'm not just eating the sandwich because it's one of three things i have for lunch i'm eating the sandwich because like i can taste like the kale and the turkey and the cheese and the mayonnaise and it's like really good like really yummy because i haven't eaten anything yummy in like two days or whatever you know so when that when there's like a lack of gratitude when there's like a lack of an appreciation for things i know that it's like a correction is coming like i just have to like that's part of like i've been orthodox eight eight years and i know i'm within the last couple of years i just know like when i start whining when I start feeling entitled, like a correction is coming and it's almost out of my control because I can't even like really make myself, I can try and I can pray, like help me to get gratitude again, like help me to not feel so entitled and like a correction will come, like something bad will happen or something that something sobering will happen. It's not always something bad. It's something sobering. And yeah, in all, thing, in all things like, I think it's a universal principle, at, at least for me. And I, I say it all the time, like starving is bad, but hungry is really, really good. Yeah. Like hungry is where you, you never want to be starving. 
because then you'll do dumb things, right? Then you'll, then you'll sacrifice your principles, right? When you're starving, you're desperate. Like you never want to get starving, but in my own life, like in all, at all levels, whether it's spiritually, physically, financially, anything, if like when I'm the moment, the times that I look back and I was like, man, I'm thankful for that time. I was hungry. Like when I'm, when I'm, fat and happy when i'm fully fed i will do the i will do as dumb of things as i will do when i'm starving <laughs> sure it's a different type of starving it's a, well perhaps right Let's it's a spiritual starvation for righteousness what did oh, you say father yeah, i hadn't even really thought about it that way <laughs> wow father what did you say i didn't hear you blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake for they shall be filled hmm Wow. Yeah. 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 I had never understood that until just now. Yeah. I said it so many times. Yeah. I'm going to butcher the quote, but I think St. John yeah. Chrysostom says you, you can't pray on a full stomach or something like that. I can't. You can't. You can't. You can't. I can't. You can't. It's very difficult. Yeah. It's like you, Father, you talked about music clouding the news. Like food clouds my news really hard. Like not yours, everyone's. Like you just mm -hmm. can't. Like that's just that is a principle. Like you just you can't, you know? And like I, okay. I'm just gonna say, right? I can pray on a full stomach, but I can't really like pray. And, and I'm a professional Christian, right? I'm a professional Christian, right? So I'm just saying you can't, like you can't actually like pray, pray on the full stomach. You, it's, you can't do it. Yeah. You, know I mean? um, you also can't, you also can't lift weights on a full stomach. It's not, it, it's, yeah. Can't do it. We can just go on and on. I mean, like, blessed are they. <laughs> well, hunger yeah, it's incredible. Stomach. It's it and it it is the pursuit. It's the and who we always hungers, say about for righteousness' God. sake. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's the pursuit of it. It's like I'm not doing it for masochism. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it to say, right. oh, look how little I ate, and oh, doesn't that make me? It's like no, no, no. I'm doing it because I can't pray on a full stomach, and That's I want right. to pray. <laughs> That's right. That's right. My right orientation towards God, you know. And I would just say, because even this is it's just a principle, right? Because, you know, what do we talk about with the sophomore slump? Why does the sophomore slump happen? Because, because you were hungry when you, yeah, with your freshman album, hungry. you were so hungry. Right. And then you got paid. You're hungry. You got paid. You're hungry to make it. You're mm -hmm. hungry, not just to make it in regards of, like, get the money and success. You were hungry to, like, to say something, mm -hmm. to experience something, to do something, right? That yes. hunger was there. That's why that, that you know. That, yeah. that freshman movement, all that stuff was there. Uh, then you got fill, you got full. Because, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's sophomore slump, not sophomore failure, per se. Sure. Yeah, it's, like, it's like, yeah, it's just not as good as that first album. It's not bad. It's just it's like, uh, right? Mm -hmm. That's what happens. You're satiated. And yeah. that's the remembrance, right? So, like, you had forgotten, that's, and you won't forgotten. remember until it comes back as, like, you're yeah. like, you know, in your soul, oh, that was, that was, that's bad. Yep. Like, that's not even a representation of me. Like, that's pretty bad. And then you get hungry again. Yep. 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 Then you get hungry. Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I would just say, you know, I want to share a little secret, you know? Um, it's just something God's given me, right? Uh, and I, I pray, I pray it's with me till I, till, till I pass, but it's God's will, you know? But it's my memory. I don't forget. You know what I mean? Like, it works, it, it, you know, it, it drives some people crazy because like, you know, I'll remember that thing you said, <laughs> you know? I'll remember it, whatever. But in this case, it's like, man, I lay down, you know? Uh, I remember, I've said this before, I remember sleeping in a shooting gallery. I just remember it. Sure. Sleeping, you know what I mean? I remember it, you know? And I remember life before, you know, I remember life before knowing him. Yeah. I remember. And I and I actively practice that remembrance. It's an active thing. 
you know what I mean? And it's just something that um, I've, I've just taken those moments, you know? Keep your I mind just, in hell. That's yeah. it. You know what I mean? And I, I just say that to encourage people because it's not some kind of like magic quality God gave me to do whatever. It's just like, it's real simple, man. It's just, if here's, I mean, here's the secret. If you want grace, right? You do those things that you know you should do when no one's looking. Mm. What are you, what are you doing? No one's around. Right? What are, you, what, what are you doing? God's around, but what are you doing? Right? That's that's how you get grace. How do you keep grace? You remember where you were. That's how I mean, you, that, that's how you keep it. Well, Father, if I if I may, if I may, because uh, just on that point, because the the corollary there, and and this is this is something that is just I am I have been so aware of for a long time. It's probably because I'm a software developer and I build the systems that do this. But like so the social media and the tendency for this always on, always saying what I'm doing, always taking pictures of everything, always taking selfies, I'm here, I'm here. You're never, someone's always looking. You're never giving yourself the opportunity to even have a moment where no one's looking so that you can just do it, not for an audience. Yes. So what are the two things I just said? I said, it, to get grace, you yep. do the things that you should do that you should do when no one's looking, right? Yes. So you get grace. But then the second thing is how do you keep it, right? You remember where you came from. You remember where you're at before, okay? So the social media thing, all that stuff, right? You're saying someone's always looking, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what else it does too? It kills your memory. You don't have to remember. You don't have to remember. And also you remember you have pseudo memories because, because you, that, you staged that selfie. That's it. But you forget the staging. That's you forget it. that you took 57 pictures for That's that picture to, to be the one that you shared. And you That's think, it. oh, it was, this was a candid moment. That's you fool it. yourself. You fool yourself. You fool yourself yeah. and you dupe yourself out of your own capacity to remember, which, by the way, is a divine act. Mm -hmm. It's a divine gift, our memory. And we, we mm -hmm. exchange it for this artificial pseudo thing. Right. I never, I never in all, like I was on a TV show and people would be like, you never take selfies. You were here. You would never, my wife would even be like, oh, you should post a, post a picture to your Instagram just of this. Oh, you went on this trip or whatever. And I would be like, no, because I, I knew I was like, I want to remember it. I just want to remember it. Yeah. There's something about like the more people take pictures in an event, the less they actually like experience it. it remember yeah, it. the less they experience it well you don't experience it you're not present you know and i'm I, I see that like i see that people here you know with the like tourists and stuff i see them coming in and like they'll you know i'll go out to the beach in the evenings with my wife and like she where she, she likes to hang out where all the russians hang out there's like that's all the tourists go around there and like i'll see these people and they'll like come on to the beach cameras out the whole time and then they'll like go and they'll like stage a few things at sunset and camera and then they'll just leave. Wow. And I'm like, first off, Saipan sunsets is like people come Incredible. here and they're like, I didn't even know a sunset could look like. Incredible. There's just something, I don't know what it is, but you're just like, I never even knew a sunset could look like this. Like, Incredible. what is this? It's it's <laughs> otherworldly. And like they miss the whole sun. They're not even looking at the sunset, they're looking at the camera. Yeah. With so much, and I'm like, I can't. I, I, like this is wild yeah i said it before and i'll say it again this wicked and perverse generation yeah it, man it's it's bad well what have um, you robbed what have you robbed yourself of in that moment in that moment you know everything that's and like i don't want to go on and on about this but i'm just saying like i i'm a i'm not a misanthrope per se no i'm not i've never really been one too much but I'm a bit of a curmudgeon. Like that is something that it just absolutely aggravates the just bejesus out of me. Like, like um, it happens a lot. There's like a couple of spots that I drive by fairly frequently, which are like, I don't know, like Instagram spots of people like, oh, yeah. like they're like, and then like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to get into this because well, I'm I want to, I want to bring this full circle, Andrew. Right. I want to bring this full circle. 
okay? I want to bring this full circle to the idea of, you know, people getting sick over the last three years and they got sick with something and that something didn't feel natural, right? And I'm, and like, I'm of the opinion, I will not say that COVID-19 wasn't real, but I'm definitely going to say that COVID-19 is not what people think it is. Absolutely. Right? Like, I do believe, I know people got sick. They got sick from something, right? But what I also know is that an entire globe full of people changed their, their, their entire environment, including their internal and external flora and fauna by changing the amount of oxygen that they were intaking, by not coming into physical contact with other people, by introducing all kinds of extra chemicals in terms of sanitation and things that they had never had. And then it's like, do you think that that is not going to have an effect on pathogens? Do you think that you're not going to introduce new sicknesses? Do you think that like, you've just, you, you've, if, if you, even if you're a materialist, never, no, I'm not going to say never mind the spiritual because it's like, you've oh, both and, right? Like both and you just completely altered human behavior, which had come about, like, we don't know, like it's the altering the signposts, right? Like we don't know. This is, this is how human beings have behaved for our entire existence. You think you can just change that globally and people won't get sick. You know what I mean? Not, I not, about, not even about whatever the first thing was. Well, whatever virus you thought there was at first. The thing that came because you changed everything. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality of it is too is that part of the problem is that there's still, for some people, isn't really a recognizing, which again, which is why one of the main mm -hmm. reasons why we're doing this project, isn't the recognizing that there is a, <clears throat> that life is, life consists of the invisible and invisible, right? And so there, that's the thing with the materialist, like they may acknowledge the quote unquote invisible on some sort of kind of like concession, but de facto they don't they don't acknowledge it, right? Everything is exclusively a material response. Fundamental or uh, pragmatically, they're, they're materialists. Like they may yeah, and de facto, yeah. right? And the reason why I'm saying that is because, um, and I, I'm gonna have to say this, then I'll have to unpack it because like with anything else, it will get misconstrued, right? If people want to, but um yeah, your thoughts, our thoughts determine our lives, as Elder Thaddeus says, you know, and like, um, you know, the, the potentials that we can create from certain spiritual and psychological dispositions are real. Does, there, it's not contingent on whether you acknowledge that reality of the potentiality or not, if that makes sense what I just said, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's it's just it is what it is right it's like what you're aimed at and headed towards what your attention is focused on is what's like yeah you're gonna encounter it i mean you're gonna get sick but it's just not the sickness you think it is mm -hmm. like you're gonna get sick with something mm -hmm. but it's not what you think it is it's you know if you sit around and think all the time i'm, I'm sick i mean hypochondriacs i'm not saying that everybody that got covid19 blah 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 was a hypochondriac it's not what i'm saying because I certainly was like, it's not a thing. It's not a thing. It's a flu. And then everybody goes and gets tested. And then they I mean, I think I think what really helps right now is to even just say, like, it's not even the thing. Like the response is the thing. That's like, that's just that's just that's something I meant to say at the beginning was the, when, we, yeah. when we say COVID, that's what I'm talking about. The response is the thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Joe yeah, I Biden, think. Joe Biden came out and said the the pandemic is over and people are still wearing masks. Like, I, I, I don't know what's going on, but like, it's like, it's still happening. It's like, so that's what we're talking about. Not the virus, but the mimetic virus, the thing that the, the shifts that happened, the change in people's attitudes the push towards extremes but it's but it's not but but it's also like 
it, the, but the it's not like we can separate a re global response that changes human behavior from the health of those human beings. <laughs> like you yeah, cannot yeah. separate, you can't separate the idea of, okay, let's shut down all of the gyms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember let's you saying that on this, on a podcast, Cyprian. And I was like, that was one of the first things that made it click. Like they didn't shut down Taco Bell. They didn't shut down Kentucky fried chicken, but they shut down the gyms. They shut down your local little healthy, like, like, here's the thing. You don't even know. You don't even, we, there's no way for us to even understand the effect on the health of the community that all of the people who are regularly going to the gym, that they're regular going to the gym and then mingling with the community, right? With their additional bodily strength, their immune system, being around other people's sweat and having developed that, that, and constantly going into that environment and doing it. We don't know what kind of diseases they were stopping from happening because those people existed in the population we don't know and then yeah. you're going to shut down elective hospital right people who would go into the hospital for something elective right so it's like wait a minute so now people who would otherwise go to a doctor's appointment how many of those people would the doctor have found something when they were there that now the doctor is not going to find. And so now it's going to infect other people. It's like do shut that down, across the entire globe. Shut down 12 step meetings and more people with that. These are just numbers. I don't know what to tell you. More people and die. leave the liquor stores open and leave the liquor stores open. And like more people died. This is not even a debate. More people died from opioid overdoses than COVID in Jackson County by like leaps and bounds we're talking like 20 30 times as many people and so to, and so to say would doing something like that would that be correlated with sickness well it already is a sickness like what we're talking about is a sickness at that's, every level that is the sickness we're talking about that's yes, but, so but it's but it's also a sickness where people go into the hospital with an upper respiratory thing that when they take a test exactly. it says COVID-19. Exactly. It's also that. Yes. Th but when we talk about it, that's what we're talking yes, about. That's what that's, it's a it's a it's an entire thing. We're not talking about a ball with little spikes coming out of it. No. We're talking about the ball with the spikes and coming out and the grand picture beyond it. Yes. That's what, and rather than just address it every time, we just say COVID. That's, That's right. what we say. And we it's talk the about phenomenon. It. It's the whole entire phenomenon. It's the, like phenomenon. The, whole it's the yes. whole thing. It's like, well, what's it like? What happens when you, you grind an entire world? We don't to know. A halt. What, what pattern changes? What, what diseases are created from that well we have no idea because guess it's never been done before right. it's never ever been done before and that is the thing we are addressing that's the yes. thing we're talking about yes and so again i don't want to harp on this too much the virus is real it's actually much more real than you realize sure it's much much bigger and much more deadly and much more dangerous and a cure quote unquote, to it is not, is not a little thing in a syringe they stick in your arm. That's not the cure. Impiety is the virus. Yes. That's the virus. Impiety and, and, and a lifetime of social condition to believe certain things that just aren't true, that are just basic biological facts that are just not, aren't, just aren't true. So the cure is the holy tradition and holy tradition is Christ. Yes. End of thought. Period. Full stop. We can send it off to the publishers. <laughs> like we're done. So Cyprian, I thought I've got about six or seven questions. We're not going to do them, but I thought maybe, um, and this question is more geared towards you. I thought maybe okay. with the last 10, yeah, 10, 15 minutes, because I haven't been writing back to folks because I was like, I'm going to save them up. And I'm going to write because this is, and I think this is kind of a timely one. I think a one that, that fits. This is from Brett 333. I'm sorry, Brett. I didn't respond to you because I knew I was going to read your question on the show. So Brett, 
it's a very long email. I'm, I, I very much enjoyed reading it. I'm not going to read all of it on the podcast. I love your story. I, 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 I hope to correspond with you in the future. Essentially, Cyprian, and what's geared more to you because it has a lot to do with libertarianism. Oh, okay. Brett basically gives this like argument on like why libertarianism is cohesive with orthodoxy. Like on like a libertarian is not necessarily like um, a bucking against authority. A libertarianism, as, as, as he is expressing it, it's not just, I don't like authority for authority's sake. I don't like the abuse of authority. And he thinks that that can work with orthodoxy. There's more facets to this question, but that was kind of the I, one. I, I, know, wanted... I, I understand what he's, I understand where he's trying to go. And this was a blind spot for me as well. Um, yes, libertarianism, the, let's say the articulated theoretical ideal is compatible with orthodoxy, I would say. But, and that's what he's expressing. But I will tell you that you can't live that ideal. I would agree like, with it's, that. It's, it's impossible to live that ideal. And it's, it becomes even more impossible if you try to get a bunch of libertarians together to do it. And this is not conjecture. I lived for a year in New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project. And what I will tell you is that the, the issue is that there is no... Um, that it is all exclusive. So meaning it's all the things that you don't do. And there is nothing that is inclusive as in this is what you orient yourself toward that we are all moving toward. So that's the problem is that you say, okay, you don't do this, but it leaves this everything else open. And the problem with like manifesting libertarianism in the real world is that you get a bunch of people together and they all want to go in different directions. And invariably, many of those directions are directly incompatible with orthodoxy. Huh. Okay. That's, that's the problem is that there is, there is nothing, you are not pointed at anything. Libertarianism, you're pointed away from things. It turns out that the things that you're pointed away from are, are compatible with orthodoxy. See, the libertarianism essentially forces you to adopt a disposition of a critic that's it exactly oh that's totally it. totally and absolutely so yes. that, and again just speaking as someone who on the rolls technically yep. i'm still registered as a libertarian technically i've been a i've been a registered libertarian since i was like 19 i think 20 right just on the rolls i've never changed it it just it doesn't matter whatever but I'm just, I'm also speaking from a different kind of experience from Cyprian, but nevertheless experience, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just saying like, that's the thing. And yep. it puts you in that, it, like, that's what defines it. And like, it's compatible in the sense of as an Orthodox Christian living in the West, living in a Protestant country and society, you have to, you have to have a measure or a facet of your MO as a critic. Mm -hmm. because your society is 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 antithetical to that fundamentally to some degree but the problem with it is is you cannot exclusively operate in that right you there has to be some sort of like like Cyprian is saying some sort of orientation towards which Christ right and so mm -hmm. like it doesn't allow for that it's too myopic in that sense of just it you can only function in in the in the critic in the negation it also it's reactionary seems, and it lacks a value hierarchy. It so also it, la it lacks values. If someone is again, if someone is looking to fix the situation with the government, again, I think that's kind of the argument we've a little bit been making is just like that's not the problem. The problem is not the government per se. Like the problem of like the role of the government is not the problem. Like it's a much larger spiritual issue. Like well, they they need to read the lives of the saints. Well, they need to start yes. reading the lives of the saints every day. Anybody who who wants to change the government needs to start reading the lives of the saints every day, because like if you do that, you're going to see just time and time again where the governors, where the 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 willingness to suffer and the martyrdom of a saint change the heart of the person in charge of the government. Yeah. Like you're going to see it almost every day. Yeah. And it's like that's so that's so there's your answer. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Like if that person just needs to read the lives of the saints and then they'll be like, oh, that's how you change the world. Oh, OK. And I, and I guess one of the big things, which is like. 
it's one of the things that I could snap my finger and just get people to really not just hear this, but to actually accept it and to, be, and to begin to live by it is that the church is our government. Mm-hmm. And the problem is, at least in my context, when I have either spiritual children or people I'm encountering who are, you know, Orthodox, or whatever, Christians, and they don't have the church as their as the government. That's the problem. That's the thing. Like that, that that's the thing. So even the people who like, forgive me, that's gonna be bold, but like where I'm off, I'll acknowledge it, but I'll acknowledge it only as far as I'm like, yeah, I'm not completely in line with the church as I should be as mm-hmm. a personal level, right? That's where I, well, that's where I can be off. But other than that, I'm not gonna be off. And that that's what can drive people. I know that's what drives some people crazy. Like I drive them nuts because like, you always want to be right. It's like, I don't want to be right. You don't understand. Like I work every, okay, I'll be, I'll be super, you know, whatever. Every half hour I'm striving to put myself. I was going to say every second, but like, okay, every half hour I'm trying to strive to put myself in line with the church. Right. That's like, that's the thing. And so, that's why it's like, no, you know, as a priest or as just a man, I'm like, no, this is the thing. It's not because it's my opinion, y'all. It's because it's the church, right? And like, I put the time in to be like, what does the church say? Like, actually, not, not how do I want to manipulate it? What does the church actually say? So when you're off or when you're caught up in whatever, or I would even dare say, if you're perceiving something like, oh, well, that's your thing. It's like, the problem will always be how far off are you from recognizing the church as your government? What have you not submitted to? Or you have not submitted yourself to the church as the authority. That's it. And it, and if you think that like, if you want to even say, if you are an Orthodox Christian, you dare say, well, blah, 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 which is that's the problem with this whole subset of people mm-hmm. in high places and ivory, ivory towers of academia who are trying to tell us something else. It's like, no, those people, you know, the, the Lord says, suffer not a witch. Um, they <laughs> need to like, that's not the thing, right? St. Like, Nic- Nikolai Vilimirovich, um, he talked about, uh, I don't, I'm not super, I'm more familiar with his writings than his life, but I, Father, he had been taken out of power by the Nazis. Mm-hmm. Okay, when he said, there was a quote where he said that, when he comes back into power, which I'm not sure if he did or not, but when he comes back into power, he's going to eliminate the seminaries. He's going to eliminate seminaries. He's going to eliminate like intellectualism. He's like, I'm going to cut it off at its root. I'm, I'm butchering the quote, mm-hmm. but he essentially said like, and I'm going to erase their names out of the people's mouths. Mm-hmm. Like, cause he's recognized the dangers of like intellectualism. And I don't want to get into it. Cause we've only got a couple of minutes left, but like do whatever you want. the undermining <laughs> the undermining of orthodoxy in america that documentary like put that in the link <laughs> that oh, i haven't even seen it oh, oh my gosh it is rough it's rough. it is rough it's, it's called I, the undermining of orthodoxy in it's america? in the it's in our thread um yeah and it's it's basically it's I'll, in our I, thread you put that in our thread yeah really? that's that thing right what, today yeah, yeah. It's that thing where I photoshot a part of it and it's talked about like, if you don't believe that COVID can be transmitted through the Eucharist, you're oh, yeah, under- yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. denying okay. the nature of Christ's humanity or okay, something I saw that. Like I that. saw that. I didn't see the link. I didn't see the link. It's like, I actually probably shouldn't have even said that. It's so blasphemous. It is so wrong. It is so absolutely abhorrent. I would go crazy if I did not know God was going to have the last word on that. That's alphabet soup it's it's mm, the it's it. the it's the jab yeah there it is of course it's it's the yeah. jab it's everything it's these high-minded intellectual people materialists materialists right, <laughs> basically <laughs> saying the, the 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 morality quote unquote of the church is a product of the time in which the church was created so basically they were a bunch of homophobes at the time Oh no. And so oh, they no. that oh, homophobia that. carried over oh, into the church. That. It's such blasphemy. I got through like 20 minutes and I, I felt like I had to take a shower. It was so abhorrent to me. 
and it was good. I, I was good. I was watching it. It was just an exercise in not getting mad of like not chucking my phone out of the window as I'm driving to work because it was just so abhorrent to me. Well, but, this is the line. This is the line, right? And oh, no. This is, this is this about is the to line. come to it. This is the line. These are these people. No, sorry. That's to the right. These are these people over here. Here's the line. They are way over there. Like, but I'm saying you have you have a line. But what's about to come to a head is there's a lot of people who don't have a line. And they're going to there is going to be something that is presented to them very, very soon where they're going to be like, well, OK, so like, here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. Um, Father, can I say something really, really quick? Sure. By the way, Brett. Brett, again, your email was lovely. I just have to say this before I forget. Father, put a pin in it. Brett, your email was lovely. You laid out a lovely thing. In no way did we mean to be insulting. You, you, it was. A, I had a great. Oh, no, time. he's not. He's not wrong. That's what I would say. Like, yes, he's he's not wrong. Like, I think both Father and I would would agree with that, and I will agree with this as somebody who has sort of lived a libertarian lifestyle. It is not incompatible for you to be both orthodox and libertarian. Right. However, just libertarian by itself is not going to 99 times out of 100. If that's all you adopt as your top thing, you are not going to end up living anything approaching an orthodox life. OK, cool. Thank you, Brett. Yeah. Lovely email. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Anyway, Father, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, um, you know, I, I think the reality of um, not just like what is coming it's it's like it's it's already here, here. oh yeah here. because being... because the thing is is like um seven standing bishops support these people seven yeah i mean that's just you know like this is going to be tough for people to hear but i'm just going to say you know like the this whole thing of um you you need you, hmm. so i'm just i'm just aware that like obviously there's a lot of you know people i know and spiritual children that hear this you know but there's a lot of people actually who i don't pastor and i don't care for which this may put you in a tough spot what i'm about to say you know what i mean but i just i have to say it right like the church is true and perfect but we are living in a time and there's, this is, it's unique in the sense of it's global, it's worldwide and it's, it's incredibly subtle and psychological in nature, the type of trials we're living under, but nevertheless, like we're living in a time where um, you, you can always, the church is true. Christ is true and every man be a liar but you have to have discernment because there are people and unfortunately there are people who have authority, right? Um, who do not line themselves up with the teachings of the church. I'm just, it's important and I, it's sad to say, but another reason for this project is that if you know, if you are in a place where maybe you're not and maybe you do see some things that are off and wrong, I just want to encourage you, it's not the church, right? It's that context or maybe the aspect of a person, but just hang in there and, and just keep seeking Christ. But just know that if you're really wanting Christ and wanting truth and you're willing to just to be, to be really frank with you, suffer, Christ will not abandon you, but you just mm -hmm. have to know, you just have to know that there are people, there are priests who are coming out of certain institutions, not all priests that come out of certain institutions, but certain institutions are just, they're generating, they've been operating out of a certain culture for many decades, and they've, they have since spawned other institutions and these institutions have received, you know, um, State money funding. from NGOs and things like that. And um, this is this is to, to dovetail off of what St. Nikolai is saying when Andrew was quoting, you know, kind of um, paraphrasing from St. Nikolai, but like, 
you know, not all these institutions have the truth of Christ and the, the benefit of the church, like, as their um, true fidelity and, 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 and goal. Um, and that NPR hit piece by that, you know, Judas of a person, like, all, there's so many people who say that they're members of the church and this and that, and, and, and they are um, enemies of the church. And it's just important to understand this, right? If you understand what I'm about to tell you, I just want to encourage you, you know, if like, you, this is one of those things on everything I say or anyone says, do your research if something doesn't feel right, whatever, you know what I mean? But I'm just saying, um, there are no heretics outside the church. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, you know, a heretic only comes from within the church in that sense. You understand what I'm saying? Sure. Um, and, you know, there are enemies from without, but the problems have always been within in that sense. You know what I mean? And it's like, um, Judas, like, Christ wouldn't even been, Christ wouldn't even been in front of Pilate and the people wouldn't even cried out for Barabbas if Judas hadn't betrayed him. Oh, yes. You, you understand what I'm saying? So it's like, I just want to say, like, just understand what that is. And that's also why, like, um, at this point in time, I, I don't, I always try to be tactful for the sake of people's repentance, but at the same time, like, you know, things are what they are. And when we're talking about like, uh, truth, or we're talking about things that matter because people falling away from faith in Christ matters to me at least. Right. And so woe unto you better that you have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea that you stumble on these little ones. That's why for me, it's like thing of like calling things out and being like, yeah, you know, this, 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 and this, because I only call something out. I don't call something out just because I don't like it. There's all kinds of stuff I don't like, but I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna spend the time talking about it. I call things out because I believe that it, it's gonna undermine and has the great potential of undermining someone's faith in Christ and the church. Absolutely. That, that that's why it matters you know what I mean baby orthodox Andrew would have probably seen some of these guys and backed what they said you know like baby little like wokey like Andrew would have been like oh yeah see the members of the church you know they're just trying to figure things out and you know like this is these are new and pressing issues it's like no it's not because the world in like record numbers is falling into like apostasy you know like you know I I we do got to get going so I won't get too into this but Again, we're going to put this in the links, but like Father Cosmos has this absolutely incredible four hour and 45 minute discussion on the implications of what COVID means for the church and like in the church's response to it. And um, one of the things that he says is, which I found so powerful, but it's, it's like George Orwell said, like a good book just confirms what you already know. But like um, he was talking about how sin is a big deal. Sin is bad. He's like, but heresy, heresy is worse. He's like, he talks, he starts correlating like all of these different like falls of like grand, like Orthodox cities to like when a heresy was gaining power. It's almost like you can see like someone cutting away like infected wounds, like off of like a body like it starts to fester they just cut the flesh out and throw it away like it's like rather than it taking the whole body it's like it's really really powerful and one of the things that father Kozma said that i had never even thought of he says that i don't teach deep theological matters because it's like if i mix up an of with a four like when he's saying something like i can accidentally preach a heresy like, and he's like, and that to me, like, granted, we've talked about what heresy is. It's a, it's when someone has corrected and a person refuses to, you know, say, oh, there is five members of the Trinity, blah, blah, blah. No, there's not. Yes, there is. And now we've taught, we're talking heresy, but what he's saying is it's like, the truth is so, it's so there it's, it, it's exactly. like, if you, it, exact. I wanted to say thin or like, exactly. yeah, it's exact. It's. This is a you fear know. of God. I mean, that he's that's that's a fear of God right there. A amen. Absolutely. I I I will put it in the link. 
on and like i cannot recommend people doing it enough i mean it it's not anything new to the people who have been kind of seeing what's going on but it it takes all of those things that we know and it just adds this huge weight to it this like really sober really good looking way of just like seeing it for what it is and just recognizing and he's seeing all the parts too because he mentions he mentions a couple other things you know and and i don't know he's just he he does this like way of speaking that's so simple and direct and you know like it's true it, it just hits so anyway well i'm pretty sure we're at two and a quarter so um I think that's it for us tonight, but um, I have about five emails. I would like to maybe start answering them on the show because they are asking good questions. So if you guys have sent in an email, please keep sending them, everyone. Um, I actually want to say, I think I'm going to stop reading the comments as much on, on the channel. If you guys have a question, please send it to Andrew at royalpath.network. I will, I will screen it. I'll see what's going on with it. If I feel like it should be on the show, I absolutely will make it on the show. Uh, I got about three or four or five more after this for the next couple episodes. Um, other than that, we still have the playlist in the merch store, which is Royal Path. Uh, what's the merch store again? Sorry. Royalpath.store. Royalpath.store. All proceeds go after the, the guy who made him gets a cut goes to a church. So don't think we're making any money off that. And then, um, and we have the, okay. So I think that's it. I think that's everything. So, okay. Thanks everyone. And thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye.